In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us your Son who gives us the bread come down from heaven, the bread of life, that we may never hunger, that we may never thirst. And Father, open up our hearts more deeply this day that we may fall in love with your plan to give us the Eucharist from the very beginning. Nourish us with this saving flesh here this day. Open up our hearts and our ears, Lord. We may hear what it is you wish us to hear, my voice to proclaim your praise. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. I've been preaching, I started a preaching series last week. I just finished one on the, the Blessed Virgin Mary not that long ago, and here we've begun our, uh, our five-week journey through John chapter 6, which is the Bread of Life discourse. So it seems just so deeply fitting to have a, uh, a five-week series on the Holy Eucharist. And so uh, last week I preached Mass as a Sacrifice. This, this week looking at the Exodus and the Passover, the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. Uh, week three, Transubstantiation and the, the Protestant understanding or belief in Holy Communion the Eucharist. Week four, the Sacred Heart and the Eucharist. And week five, Reverence, Piety and devotion to the Holy Eucharist. Again, this week, the Exodus and the Holy Eucharist, and most everything that I'm going to preach on today really comes from a beautiful book called, called uh, from Brent Petrie called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Holy Eucharist, if you want to dive into a, a greater study of it. Um, the most common held belief for us as, as Catholics, for us in the, in the Christian world, when we look at when we look at Judaism, or certainly first century Jews, the most common held belief that as they were awaiting the Messiah, is that we think that they were awaiting the Messiah just as one to save them from the earthly oppression. One that was going to come in and swoop in on a, uh, on a white horse and just save them from, from Roman domination there in Jerusalem. But that isn't the case with the prophets. That isn't the case with the scriptures. I mean, I've said it that way, I've preached it that way in a sense, but that isn't what the prophets taught. That isn't what the first century Jews actually wanted as a people. What they wanted and what the prophets prophesied about would be that the Messiah would come in and he would lead his people in a new exodus. That he would that God, the Messiah, would come and that he would lead the Jewish people out of slavery and begin a new exodus for them. And so this is the greatest sign of the Messiah, that he himself was going to come and that he would lead the people in a similar way as the first exodus. And so we're hearing in John's Gospel, we we're take a break from Mark's Gospel, we're, we're hearing from John's Gospel, but so John the Evangelist actually spells it out so beautifully. He spells out how it is that, that Jesus, the Messiah, is this Messiah who's coming for the new exodus. At the start of John's Gospel, we know our scriptures, at the start of John's Gospel, we hear, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. What does that sound like? It sounds just like Genesis, doesn't it? In the beginning was light. In the beginning was the creation. In the beginning was God. And so then, in, as you follow John's Gospel, the, John the Evangelist, he writes, the next, Jesus goes down to be baptized. Where does he be baptized at? He's baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. And so the Jordan is significant because as the Jews exited out of slavery in Egypt, they marched through the Red Sea. We know the story. But when they got to the Jordan River, that was them reaching the Promised Land. That was the last time that we really hear about the, the, someone going into the Jordan was there in the Exodus. And so Joshua and the tribes, they reach there. And then what happens? The river parts, just as at the Red Sea with Moses. Joshua parts the river as he steps foot in there. And all the priests and all the tribes, they walk through into the Promised Land. Here in Jesus' baptism, the Jordan isn't parted. But what is parted? The heavens. The heavens are opened up because this is a new exodus. And this exodus isn't an earthly journey. It isn't a journey into Jerusalem, but it's the journey, the exodus from slavery of sin into heaven. So then John the Baptist cries out, Behold the Lamb of God! Behold the Lamb of God! What does that mean? 
Any, uh, any Jew hearing that or a Jewish reader or, or anyone in earshot would know that there's only one Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. And so the Gospel writer, St. John the Evangelist, is foreshadowing that Jesus is the Passover Lamb, that he's the one who will be, who will be slaughtered. And so what comes right after Passover? Moses, remember the story. What comes right after Moses? He, they tell him to take the blood of the lentils and put it on there, and then he leads the people through the Red Sea. Remember? He leads the people through the Red Sea. And so we are hearing in John's Gospel here, but what happens right before this? We hear that the crowd didn't see Jesus nor his disciples, how they got to the other side. We don't hear it, unfortunately. But Jesus walks on the water. The disciples are all afraid, and Jesus walks out on the water. So our God, the Messiah, doesn't just part the sea. He walks on the water. This is a new exodus. This is a new story, a new exodus being played out right before our very eyes. But for us to really understand that we have a new exodus, we have to understand that we're also having a new Passover. In order to have a new exodus, we have to have a new Passover. So let's just remind ourselves what happens here at Passover. Moses receives a command from God to have a year-old lamb, unblemished, slaughter the lamb, take the blood, sprinkle it on the lentils of the doorpost, then, important fact, then the family would gather around and they would eat the roasted lamb. It's essential for the family to eat the Passover lamb. Then the angel of death would pass over the houses marked with blood, and those that were not marked with blood, those who did not feast on the Passover lamb, their firstborn was killed. So what would happen if, uh, if the family didn't like lamb? What if they, they really just didn't like the taste of lamb? Say they slaughtered it, sprinkled the blood, and they just didn't have lamb that night. They'd wake up in the morning and their firstborn would be taken. It was necessary for the lamb to be sacrificed and eaten. The, uh, the, the climax of the Passover wasn't just sacrificing the lamb, it was consuming its flesh. So the Passover ritual develops over centuries, right? The, the Jews grow, they, they leave Egypt, and the Passover celebration and the Passover festivities, the ritual, the liturgy, if you will, continues to develop over the centuries. Last week I preached on Mass as a sacrifice and how when we come to Mass, we are at Calvary. And the Jews believed that too. The Jewish people believed as they celebrated Passover, as they gathered with a family, that it wasn't just a remembrance. They weren't just recalling facts. We're not just saying a few words up here. We are at the foot of the cross here, and the Mass is powerful. So the Jews believed that they were at Passover. So as the liturgy, as the Passover meal, as the Passover celebration uh, changed over the centuries, the father would have a role to play with his son. And the son, the eldest son, would ask his dad there at the meal, he would say to him, he would say, Father, why is this night so different than any other night? And why do we eat unleavened bread? And why do we eat roasted bread? flesh of the lamb. And then the father replies like this, and he has to say it like this. He says, it is because what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, this is four, five, six hundred years after the Passover. So the Jews understood that the Passover meal was for them at that moment. It didn't matter how many centuries. They believed that they were there. They saw it as an act of, as an act of Passover. And that they were entering into a hoping for a greater exodus now to lead them out of slavery. And so if Jesus is a new Moses prefigured, leading God's people into a new exodus, a heavenly promised land, there has to be a new Passover. And the new Passover of the Lamb is Christ himself. His blood poured out on the lintels of the cross. And so the Passover sacrifice is Jesus' offering on the cross. But the Passover sacrifice isn't completed until we eat the flesh of the Lamb. Eat the flesh of the Lamb of God who is, who is offered for us here. And thus we fulfill 
the Passover of the New Covenant each and every Sunday, each and every Mass that we participate on, in, and Calvary is made present to us at every Mass. And it gets better. It gets better. If Jesus is the new Moses, leading God's people through a new exodus into the heavenly promised land, that means our exodus is ongoing. That means we're in the midst of our journey. We're in the midst of our exodus now in this world. And God gave his people manna. That's what we hear in the first reading. God gives his people manna to eat this mysterious bread. What is it? That's what it means in Hebrew, manku. What is it? God gives them this mysterious bread, but the people grumble, didn't they? That's not us. We never, we're Catholics, we never complain, right? God's people grumble, and then he gives them quail, flesh. So even in the very beginning, God is foreshadowing in the evening twilight, I'm going to give flesh for you to eat. See how the Lord is foreshadowing. If Jesus is the Messiah, if he is the fulfillment of this new exodus, then he would give his people food also, won't he, in the midst of our exodus. And he gives us his flesh to eat, the new manna, bread from heaven, the manna that God gave to his people there in the first exodus, dried up when they hit Jerusalem, when they hit the Jordan River, the land flowing with milk and honey, so too the Eucharist is a foretaste for us of heaven. That is, we partake in it now, we are brought into the very midst of our divine Savior. It is food for the journey. It is our foretaste, our nourishment, our means, it's our strength, it's our, our, our sustenance to get by. God's divine plan has always been to feed his people with his flesh so that we can be united to him in his very lifeblood. As we receive him today, let's not grumble. Let's not grumble in our hearts wishing we had more, wishing that we were like the, the family across the street or whatever it is that we got going on. Let's not grumble, but instead let's pour our hearts out in thanksgiving. And let's place our trust in our saving God who leads us in our exodus into the new and heaven, heavenly promised land. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 